Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, George, for introducing us. This is your first Juju charm. Uh, as George said, it is the most important talk. I would argue that I think this morning's keynote is probably the most important talk in grasping what Juju is. But when you're getting ready to get started with Juju, writing your first Juju charm really kind of gets you to the concepts of what advantages Juju really gives me as an operator or as a user. Um, so I'm Marco Ceppi, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm a Juju charmer amongst other things. Uh, so I'm one of those prickly people who are reviewing and making sure stuff that lands in our charm store isn't uh, going to root your box, steal your passwords, destroy your infrastructure, or cause havoc, and they actually follow a good development practice, uh, are of good and sound quality, and generally work across all of our clouds. Uh, there's a talk later on today about um, Oh, exactly that, how we do CI for our charms. How do we actually make sure they work on all of our charms? Uh, that's in the testing track, so it's not here, but it will be recorded probably, so it's probably should check out. Um, but Juju charms, the Juju charms we mentioned before, they're how you model that application bit. It's how you put down the code that's required to stand up, not just deploy that service, but how that service connects to other applications and how you scale that application and then more importantly, how you manage its life cycle over time. So it's not just getting something stood up. It's relatively easy today with a lot of the tools in the market to deploy something. But managing that service and application over time is actually a tricky task. Uh, so charms bring in that set of primitives that's not just how do I install and lay down bits on a disk, but how do I configure it? How do I mutate that configuration over time? What happens when I need to change something in flight during a deployment? And then finally, how it connects to other applications. And then how do I run administrative <coughs> tasks against this, which is a common enough thing. If you have to SSH into something in a Juju model, as long as you're not a first user, like George pointed out, and want to check things and poke them, we failed as a model. So Juju tries to abstract away all the needs for you to really SSH into something and start poking and prodding. Because once you do that, you have essentially mutated and made that item something unique as a snowflake amongst the model. And it's very hard to track User, uh, user change stuff. So charms also provide a way for you to say, here's actually what I need to do. Here are the tasks and provides a repeatable and reliable way to run those against your services amongst everything else. Um, so to really grasp how charms connect to everything, sorry, it's getting a little jittery. Um, it, it's good to know that Juju is um, a lot of things, but at, at its heart, it's basically an event server. It's taking either input from a user or input from applications in your deployed environment and it's saying, I need to, and it's translating that to events that need to run on an application or a set of applications or a set of tools. Things like, I need to scale these things, or you need to run this set of tasks now. Uh, so Juju's kind of managing this as an event. So it's blasting out these events, uh, and Charms respond to those events. Uh, and that's how we've been doing things for a while. But now we realize that there's more than just an event, but there's also the state of the charm. What, what is the state of the service that's running in? And that's this new approach that we've created uh, called Reactive and Layered. That's what I'm going to talk to a bit about today. Um, uh, so again, charm is just code from the original side there. Um, that's really important to note as well, is that when you're building charms, when you're connecting to them, you can't really make any assumption about what they are. Uh, so Juju, in the model, tends to abstract that away. Um, so building your first charm. Uh, the hello world of cloud deployment. So I'm gonna use an example. Uh, was last week I was at Scale 14X in LA, uh, co-located with UbuCon, um, and it was fantastic. It was a great time, lots of great talks. Uh, it's kind of hard to go from Europe to the west coast of the US, I know, uh, but they are a great set of talks there. Um, and I gave this talk and I actually helped set up a bit of that conference. So if you're gonna be starting with Juju Charms uh, and writing them, you'll need these two things, Juju and Charm Tools and Charm Tools greater than 1.11.0. If you're on Windows, we have Windows installers for Charm Tools. If you're on Mac, you can brew install Charm Tools anytime. Uh, and if you're on uh, Ubuntu or Debian, you'll want to use this PPA down here until we release Xenial, where we'll have the latest and greatest in the archive. Um, so, like Mark was mentioning earlier, it's more than just the expertise in that component. It's more than just how do I set up this application? What we found a lot, and what I'll show you um, how we did at Bucon, is that a lot of these applications share common components. They share common ground. An example is almost most software today <coughs> deploys a web application, some kind of web service that you connect to. And almost all of that is running in front of something like Apache or Nginx 
or light HTTPD or some kind of Apache daemon, uh, web daemon in front of that. How you set up and configure that Apache service is pretty easy. Most platforms you just apt get, yum install, um, build it, and install the application. But what's really hard is how do you manage Apache or Nginx or any of these web services at a scale of over a thousand operations a second, a million requests a second? What does that look like? How does that configure the tuning options there? Apache, Nginx, all of these web services can scale to that amount on a single node. I've seen it done, it's crazy, but it's possible. But it takes a lot of time and expertise to learn what do you need to tweak and tune based on the characteristics of the machine. I've got this much RAM, this much disk, I've got this much CPU. Based on those, I have to set all these primitives to get just the right amount of caching, just the right amount of process forking, or maybe not even process forking at all. It should be pre-fork or whatever it may be. Or in Nginx, I need to configure how I do my micro-caching and where I save that. It needs to be on SSD to serve real quickly. All of those things are things you gain in experience over time. But there's a very small amount of people who know exactly how to do that. Unless you're running in a company that's serving these requests a million times a second, you generally don't come across how to manage these things at scale. So it's great that we can build an entire component as a charm and deploy. Here is my Django website. But you need to know a lot of different components and how they actually work at scale in order to really set up, here's the expert way to deploy Django. So what we've realized is, is that we can use things, uh, this new approach called layers, um, to say not just the charm of the single component, but the components, the single individual services inside that charm that build up to that layer. How do I install Apache expertly? How do I install Django? How do I install Nginx? How do I install these components? And then really what I want to do is take all the expertise of those components and then put my bits on top of that. And I don't want to have to deal with mangling or merging code for these things. I don't have to copy code around in boilerplate, which is what we were doing for quite a while. You built a charm from scratch. You started with a blank directory. You built a bunch of files. You copied things from other things that were other charms that looked interesting. And then once those charms improved, they got better, there's no real way for you to say, I want that expertise back in here. Layers distills that in a way that you can simply say, I need these components from these experts that have produced them, and I need to build a charm on top of that. Um, so that's what these layers do, is they share that operational knowledge. They share how it is to set up that single component that you need as a part of your stack of software that builds that application. Uh, and they're the way to share that. So, uh, the AbuCon community came up to me and they were like, we need to deploy our site, abucon.org. Uh, we need to deploy it and we need to be ready for people to hit it while at the conference. Uh, we want to do it with Juju and Charms. We don't know where to get started. So I said, I, being, being a Charm community member, I said, yes, that's a great idea, first of all. Um, second of all, I'd love to help you. How? How do you deploy AbuCon? What is abucon.org? So they came back with a list of things. Well, it's a Django website. Okay, it's pretty simple. I think I know how to set up Django. Uh, and we need a web server to serve our image and static content. And then we need a Postgres database in order to store our content data. So that sounds pretty simple. Uh, we have web server charms and we have a Postgres charm. Um, we have the Django charm. I should be able to put this together. And they said, but we need to run a whole bunch of set of commands once you've deployed Django the baseline in order to import our settings, import our content, derive the right ACLs, build this base layer up. So it's not just Django, it's Django with a bunch of these cool things on top of it that need to run and configure in order to build their application. I said, okay, well, that's, that's a little harder. Um, so with layers, this actually made it pretty easy though. Uh, before, I'd have to build a whole custom bespoke charm of all these little things that I've copied and pasted from other charms that do these components. Uh, but with layers, I can do something like this. I can say, well, I need to set up a new Abuku charm, Abukan charm. So in here, I need to include Django is a component, and Nginx is a component. And that's it. I've essentially now built my custom Django stack on top of there. Uh, it won't do anything. It'll just install Django and Nginx side by side. But I have the primitives of the components in order to interact with Django and Nginx. So when you look at something like Django, Django as a layer includes these set of things. So we've got something like a, a base layer to build off of, and then these interfaces to connect to Postgres and HTTP. And so, when you start looking at layers, layers are a, a combined way to build a single, that single charm application. And when you look at layers, um, we abstract away a lot of the complexity that is to deploy Django. So when I build this, I won't get anything but Django running because I haven't told any custom instructions. Um, 
But I get something like this. It pulls in all of these layers and builds them in a way that they are isolated from each other. They won't run and conflict with each other. It knows the versions it pulled in and it builds a complete charm that I can deploy today. So the output of this is a charm in its fullest form that you can go and deploy. And what's great about this is as the Django layer improves, as the connections between Postgres and, and HTTP and Nginx improve, I can continue to build my charm and build a solid, always working, compact artifact. How this applies is the complexity for installing and managing Django at scale are in that layer. There could theoretically be, but there isn't currently, a Puppet layer. And in that layer it says, here's everything you need to install Puppet, and then this will give you mechanisms to hook in to say, once Puppet's ready, I need to do all these things. So the mechanism to do that is the reactive framework. And I'm going to drive in a bit more about how do I go from just building a charm that has all these components in there to making it my own service. How do I go and put the custom bits I need to on top of a bootcon to make it a full Django stack that runs for me? So we have this thing, Reactive Framework, which is the component, which is the framework that allows you to communicate between these layers. So when you build a charm, you have to be able to say, when is Nginx ready? I need to do these things. So the Nginx layer will do everything it needs to to set up and configure, and then it'll say, I am now ready. And what I can do in a Wukong layer is say, when Nginx is ready, I can start my Django process, or I can do these tasks. When Django is installed and configured, I can now run my custom Django commands and know that these things are in there. So reactive layer provides, reactive framework provides that primitive for communication between these layers. And it provides a set of these kind of commands that you can hook into. So for instance, you can do things like setting states and removing states. So Nginx can declare, I am now installed. Nginx is installed and configured from this layer perspective and you're good to go. What I can do in layers further up is I can say, once Django is installed and configured, and once Nginx is installed and configured, I can say, when these things are right, ready, I can run my custom code and know that those components are there are, are ready to go. And what's great is um, when you look at the code for UbuCon layer, which is really the important thing, it is just the logic that you need to do the UbuCon stuff. It doesn't have all the complexities of installing and managing Django. That's managed a layer down in there. So what this looks like as code, as an example here, is you have something like this, where when Juju tells you it's time to do an install, you can do these certain things and set a state that the dependencies are installed. Now every layer can say when depths are installed, I can do these things. So in the same layer I can say when my depths are installed, I can install my software. By responding to states, you set a declarative um, and really, well, explicit example of how this charm works in these varying levels. It's very easy to read and walk through as a user. And what's great is, much like Juju, layers are also agnostic to language. So this is an example in Python, but could just as easily be this, where the same constructs are primitive, but they're done in batch instead. When the hook install is run, this batch method will execute. When depth install, the state is done, this stuff will run in batch. And what's really interesting is that porting over your service configuration management installations or whatever shell scripts you have currently is very easy because we have the primitives in the language for you to hook in at any length. So this and this could be any language you imagine. Could be Ruby, could be um, well, any other language. I don't know, I blanked on anything. I was gonna say Java, but I was like, maybe not Java. Um, <laughs> but it could be any language. So that's what's great about this reactive framework. It's just like charms, just like Juju. It's an agnostic way for you to signal between layers what is going on and how you respond to those states during that installation. Um, so the last bit of this is, uh, the bit that's probably the most important is, how do you, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, is there any possibility for so for deadlocks, for example? So one app. So so both the uh, charms are waiting for each other to make a connection, and they uh, both require something that the other uh, charm does. Right. So the question is: Is there a possibility for deadlock where both are waiting on each other to talk to each other? That's a great question. Uh, the way that gets resolved is with these interface layers. Um, so I'll show you what that looks like in a second, and we'll dive into a bit more comprehensive examples. They're kind of high-level primitives, and then the actual examples of code may alleviate that a bit more. But um, unless something is coded improperly, you shouldn't run into areas of deadlock. There should always be, I'm waiting for something to happen. And that something, if it depends on that thing to be finished, 
there's a problem. You, you miscoded the concepts of how that relationship works between two surfaces. Usually what you end up with is um, a complex stack like this, where you have a set of services that connect to one or more components, in this case, this little guy in the middle here, where he cannot be ready to speak to MongoDB until Cassandra, this other service, and this other service have finished the communication channels there. So what happens is each one of these relations, each one of these lines, um, that communication channel is embodied in code. So as Mark was mentioning earlier, the communication between these two services, the person who writes what that definition is, for instance, MySQL. MySQL is a pretty pristine definition. The MySQL service, whatever's providing MySQL, whether it be MySQL or MariaDB or Percona or any of those other flavors, they all provide an interface to MySQL. They will always provide you with a host name, a username, a password, a database schema, and a port to run against. So that protocol is defined. Those keys, you can always guarantee that you'll get those keys. Um, the problem is, is that as you get the more complex situations where this service may send you a set of data, which you then do computations upon and send back additional data, where you have a back and forth channel, which interfaces allow you to do, it's hard to know what state am I in? Am I waiting for them to send me something? Do I need to create something and send them? So when we have interface layers, um, interface layers abstract that as code, and abstracts it as code in a generic way. So, much like you can have Python and Bash, when you build charms, charms can be built with varying layers of competing languages. You can have a Bash layer, a Python layer, and maybe even a Puppet layer, all in, all in the same charm, potentially. Um, so when you get down to things like interfaces, um, we define these as kind of a special spec. This is basically the code, the spec for that communication channel as code. Um, so when you get Postgres and you get HTTP, it pulls those interfaces libraries in, and then you can respond to events within there. So you can say that when the database is available, which is a state that's set by that relation, it'll pass you in an object that you can use to say, here's my user, password, database, and host. Or you can set states like, for instance, there's one where it's uh, the relation <coughs> needs user, or, or needs schema, or needs something. You can say, when I need to supply something, I will supply it back to that class, it sends it over the relation, it does more magic, and then sends back another state that I respond to. So you're always explicitly responding to a state, and that state's very pristine code that you need there. Um, so I'm gonna walk through a couple of examples um, while we have time. Uh, the first is the full Ubucon layer, what it looks like, what the Django layer looks like, and then MongoDB, and then we'll talk a bit more about how the implementation details are. But while I'm getting this demo set up, anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, so in the Django example, you, you had interface HTTP, or uh, yeah, interface HTTP as a requirement and interface Postgres as a requirement. Um, presumably, there would be a way to say interface database or something, because Django supports several ah. databases. And that is true. Wondering about is this just like a, a contrived example, and so it doesn't allow for that kind of thing, or am I going to need a separate Juju charm for every possible configuration of HTTP and database? That's a fantastic question. So by default, all relationships to Juju are optional. So what you could have here is right now the Django layer, because I'm major, I'm pretty lazy as a developer, only supports Postgres because that's what the people ask me to support. Okay. But if you say, well, I have a need for Django to also support MySQL, you could take this layer, fork it, add the interface MySQL spec in here, add the states to how, it, how Django needs to react when MySQL is related, okay. and then contribute back. And now everyone who builds going forward, suddenly their build, the ability to connect to a MySQL database is there. And their layer that does their logic on top of that is still agnostic to that at all. They could, the operator could have related to MySQL. Django takes care of the complexity of setting up that connection string and all the modules it needs for that. Then the top layer just says, I need to import data, I need to run these Django commands, Django site admins, etc." cetera. You, okay. I think what actually has to happen in the Django, at some level Django needs to know the difference between Postgres and MySQL. So yes. a different Python driver effectively yep. for those two. So that gets abstracted into that Django layer. If someone adds MySQL or someone adds another SQL sort of driver into Django, then everybody else who's using the Django layer their charms would magically get that extra interface and they could magically talk to other SQL right. Right. Okay, so in this case, it doesn't actually care which web server you use. Ah, that's even more important. So this isn't the web server. I think that is... 
This is how I would link this service to external services. Okay. So Django provides a website. The HTTP interface is the protocol for how do I advertise my website to people. So if I want to deploy Django and add a caching layer like Squid, or if I want to add HAProxy, it uses that HTTP interface to communicate that data. So when I relate my new Wukong charm to our, our load balancer, all the units of that, of that service say, here's my IP address, here's my port, and here's where I'm running. And the load balancer then can take that data and configure its configuration files to load balance appropriately to each one of those units. So this isn't necessarily the interface for the web server I'm using here. Django will just spin up, I think it just uses GUnicorn at the moment. Yeah. The Nginx layer I use at this top says, I configure Nginx to point at GUnicorn from this top layer. because This is an application specific decision. That could be Apache, that could be any other web server, or none. It could just be GUnicorn running in the raw. Okay, so the interface include in Django is saying, I speak over HTTP, not I require an HTTP server. Yes, and that becomes, ah, the, okay. that becomes strikingly obvious uh, in the demo. But <laughs> yeah. each interface is this, is this mapping here. Right, okay. Exactly. No, 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 no. Oh. That's that's the relation. Uh, but the relation uses the interface. That's what you've got at either end of a relation is two right. interfaces of the same type. Okay. Right? And just just one thing that took me a long time to figure out that HTTP doesn't actually have anything to do with the HTTP protocol. It's just a name that essentially happens, of course, to be a set of conventions by which two things that are going to talk HTTP to each other can agree all the things they want to know to be able to talk HTTP to each other. So things like port, username, um, path. Yes, right. a, a, a path as a sort of subtree effectively. Yeah, so if you're going to put a squid... So you could name anything, it doesn't have to be HTTP. That's exactly right. It can be, yeah. That's exactly, that could be Willy Wonka, right? It's just a name. It's got, there's no relationship to a protocol name or anything else like that. What does matter is that all of the charms that claim to speak Willy Wonka are going to have a happy experience when they exchange a set of messages to agree whatever it is that they're agreeing. Right? In this case, it is going to be that they agree to talk HTTP on a port with the username and password with a path. Right? There's a set of things that have become conventionally associated with that name. Okay, so interface Postgres isn't saying, I need a Postgres database. It's saying, I know how to talk to one. It's, it's saying... It's saying exactly that. I can be related to something else that talks the code. Oh, okay, that, that makes so much more sense. So in your case, you have a database, right? Yeah. You will want to essentially provide an interface layer for things that are going to talk to you, because then writing the charm on the other side becomes super easy. They just say, I want to talk to your, this data, your Neo4j database. Your code will get spun up into their charm over there. If someone draws that relation, your code is executing on both sides, and you will then pop up on the client side there uh, in the reactor framework. You'll pop up an event effectively so that there are other layers in their charm can then say, great, I'm good to go. Ah, perfect. Right? Okay. So you've done all the hard work on both sides so that it's really easy for the charmer to glue into you effectively. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, no, that's fantastic okay. feedback. And much in the same vein, uh, there aren't many competing <coughs> implementations of Postgres, but MySQL is an example of that where the interface MySQL doesn't necessarily mean Oracle's MySQL. It could be Maria, it could be Percona, it could be any of those guys that offer that, or even <coughs> RDS and Amazon, for, for example. Um, so it's more interface in the programming uh, yeah. sort of, yeah, okay, I implement this interface, not, okay, that makes sense. So I'm going to pull up a terminal. Well, Mark pulled it up. The really interesting thing there is that you include that layer, the Nginx layer, mm -hmm. and then you you don't have to go copy and paste, you get all that extra piece of whoever made that internet layer, so you start putting your deltas on top of that. Yeah. Same thing with the interface, so you include the Postgres interface, you can go read and then on how they should talk over the Postgres interface, you just start leveraging that and writing what you want to do in your application to react to that. Right. So it's really just trying to focus on what you want to do in your application, leveraging all the community expertise between the internet layer and the Postgres interface, and then combine your deltas, so it makes you, keep you in the area comfortable with. You also have to scale because it's so like when the MySQL database gets you know, so to so a certain load level, you can say I'll try to do a second unit and just get that thing to go to the and all that kind of stuff and get it down and all that thing. And then as more, since it's open source, you can share it, and other people spin up on different environments. You try it, you're like, you know what I'd really love to have is this different interface or a different config, put into a layer, and then everybody gets to share it, and the layers get more rich and rich and rich, the interfaces get more rich and rich. You get to you know, focus on the areas you like to. 
that someone else may take advantage of later on. So it's, you know. No, that's, 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 yeah. that's great. As an application developer, I literally don't care where my data gets stored. As a database developer, I kind of care about that. It's, it's really nice to abstract that. Cool. The reason I think this is so interesting is I'm pretty sure all of the config management tools are going to come around to the model approach, right? It's, it's a, just a much nicer way to work. Um, but what's really being teased out here is the idea of how do we collaborate around the code that goes into these models, right? How do we make open source communities that essentially enable us all to go faster? And that's a really interesting problem, but I think the layer stuff has shaken out. We, we never had that two years ago, right? Because we hadn't really run into that problem. As the community scaled, as the number of people trying to write chant, as the number of potential connection points grew, we realized that what we needed to do was a way, a way to reuse code very, very efficiently and reliably. And operational code. And that's what this is turned into. Okay, the clapping lets me know that we're getting pretty close to the end of my talk. Um, so this is, on the left here, this is my UbuCon layer. Uh, this is the more fleshed out version of what I showed you uh, in my slides. And so what I'm gonna do real quickly is just open up um, a couple things. Here's that layer.yaml file I mentioned. Oh, I have to be in there. Um, and it is as simple as I declared it to be. <coughs> Django and Nginx. Um, if you've ever written a charm before, you'll see this and you'll think this does not look like a charm uh, on the left-hand side. I'm just going to, for the sake of distractions, get rid of this window over here really quick. Just come back to that guy in a second. Uh, Um, so, wow, all right, I can type, I promise. Uh, every layer has pretty much kind of the same primitive. You'll probably find a metadata YAML file. This is the primitive from Juju. This describes what this application is. Its name, its description, the author who wrote this, and then more importantly, how it communicates with the rest of the ecosystem. What interfaces and relations it provides and what relations it requires. So I'll show you that in just a minute. But the real meat of this is this reactive directory and this ubucon.py. This is the logic that builds on top of all of these previous layers. So if I open up this reactive ubucon file, um, the color's off. Uh, after doing a bunch of Python imports for the reactive framework uh, and some helpers that wrap Juju for Python, I have these kinds of declarations in here. So when Django's available is something that Django tells me. And when Django's not ready, which is something that I'm setting, I know that I need to do a bunch of tasks. In this case, I need to run an itdb on Django, and I need to collect all the statics and compile the statics. And then I declare that now Django is ready. If these commands succeeded successfully and Django's installed as it advertised, I am ready, which means that this method will not be run again. I've declared it's ready and Django's available. Um, so when Nginx is available, and when Django is ready, I'll need to create a virtual host for Nginx so it knows how to find my G-Unicorn process running. So this is just a bunch of template rendering, and that's the bottom of the file. That's it. That's all I had to do to get Ubucon built on top of Django. Now, there are much more complex Django examples um, to do this, but essentially I'm setting and responding to states. Um, real quickly, I want to show you what the Django layer looks like. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty simple. Uh, same example again, down here. It just includes the basic layer, which is kind of a baseline layer that everyone includes to get some basic dependencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the Postgres interface, which is actually spelled PGSQL, sorry for that information detail, and the HTTP interface. And what it does is defines how it runs. So if you see here, it's pretty much the same structure. I've got a couple of different files now. I've got a config.yaml, so it, sets a, it, it exposes a set of configuration options for the user to manipulate. Uh, it has its own metadata file that declares the metadata that's responsible for this layer. And then it has a reactive file in a django.py. And if I look at that, you'll see a lot more code that manages what it means to set up and install Django. This is 166 lines of code rather than the previous 80-something. After a copious amount of um, Imports, I do things like uh, set up the baseline. So whenever Juju emits the install events, I respond to that hook. Hooks in Juju are what respond to events. They're kind of one-off declarations that Juju pushes out. 
Um, I add users. I install a ton of packages. Um, I install some other bits through pip. Um, and then I go down here. But then I also have other states that I declare. So this actually should declare a So here's an example of how the Django database is ingested then. So I say, when Django source is available, that means the Django itself has been installed. Whatever the user's application is defined has been installed. And Postgres, oh, sorry, sorry. That's, and Postgres is not connected. I tell the user, you have to connect me to Postgres before I continue. That's how we get past things like deadlock. Um, there are a huge set of primitives, and 30 minutes was actually not enough time for this. Usually this is about an hour long session. Um, Juju provides a huge set of primitives that allow you to communicate back to the user and query Juju directly. Um, so this is a great, so that, that's a great example of that interlock across the topology, right? So what you saw there was, um, say you deployed HA proxy in front of Squid, in front of um, a Django thing in front of Postgres. The um, Postgres, that little snippet of, of, of Django, will say, I'm going to set the status of the Django portion to blocked with a message saying, I'm waiting for Postgres until the Postgres relation is in place and the Postgres database is ready, effectively. So HA proxy doesn't have to know anything about the Postgres database. The HA proxy can stay nicely encapsulated. It's just watching the thing that it's talking to, which is the Django app. And it will just see the Django app first saying blocked, which is fine, it can't do anything about that. But it could put a message up for the user, right? It could say, the thing that I'm in front of is currently down because of this, right? And so that way we keep the line of encapsulation really clean. Um, and that's it's those four lines of code at the top, right? Just saying, as long as Postgres is blocked, my Django stuff is blocked as well. When Postgres unblocks, Django will un unblock, which will probably, this is a layer, it will probably unblock this whole charm effectively. And then HA proxy will see that, and HA proxy will be doing what it does. All right, just two more minutes of your time. I appreciate it so far. Um, so the, the opposite declaration is when my database is available, my Postgres database has been marked as available, Postgres, the interface library, said all of the credentials that I require for you to succeed in configuring Postgres have been submitted. So there's that bit of code written by the Postgres SQL interface author that says you're going to expect these keys. When you get these keys and you validate that there are actually connections, uh, connection can be made, you set the state, the Postgres database is available. And when I know that Django source has been available, and when Django has not yet been configured, I need to configure Django. So it goes through, writes out the Django configuration file, um, <laughs> renders it as local.py.j2, and then it sets the state Django configured. So this makes sure that once Django's configured, does it continue to try to reconfigure itself? That's really the difference is when you see these decorators here, these are states declared by that charm. I'm in this state, and that state persists constantly. So you can always assert when that state is. Um, not to go down too far, but it goes through and makes sure that all the other components are running, 166 something lines of code to get Django running. The important thing is, is that um, these two components live separate from each other. So Django can be theoretically imported by any charm that wants to build on top of Django, and UbuCon could be even imported. If you say, I, my charm declared, my charm, my charm layer depends on the UbuCon layer, you can start asserting states even higher above that, build something on top of the UbuCon layer, which implicitly includes Django and Postgres and all those other components. Uh, when you run that charm build command, so it'll take a few seconds since I'm tethering through that giant orange box over there. Um, what it does is it compiles this into a charm. It builds it into a charm that can be deployed and consumed by Juju. So it sets up all the scaffolding that Juju requires and how Juju transmits and emits events to that charm. So Juju does that through hooks. So it builds a bunch of these hooks that all allow you to then respond to those states in Juju. But most importantly is it combines all of those layers into a single file. And because things are namespaced as the layer name in Reactive, they're all here. The Django layer, the Nginx layer and the Ubucon layer all exist in the reactive directory. They all respond and set and emit states. And the reactive frameworks take care of whenever Juju initiates an event, it goes through and says these are the states and the methods that will run, evaluates that over and over and over again, and eventually gets you to a consistent state where all the application, all the layers agree that everything is installed and managed and configured properly. And every time a user 
mutates that model, whether they are adding a new relation or configuring, uh, changing a configuration option on that, on that application or scaling that application, the reactive states will respond accordingly, create new states, and the code that needs to respond to those states exists there. Um, and then this can be deployed and managed and rebuilt over and over and over again. Um, I did gloss through a few things. Uh, Juju provides a set of ways to hook into the model so the charm can communicate to the model, get data from the, from the model, things like what is my IP address, what machine am I running on, um, have, I declared any, have I declared anything, how do, how do I get configuration from the user. Uh, I thought these were a little longer talk, so I apologize, but um, these are also primitives that exist there. If you're here for the workshop days, I recommend it. If you're curious about this, if you're not quite sure what this is, if you're a bit confused, we can sit down and go a bit more on topical examples, something you're deploying today, something you're looking to deploy, something you created in application. They really walk through this more in a fine detail, but what I want to make clear is that these reactive states give you the ability to build upon the expertise of everyone deploying those components. So if your application requires a set of components, you can find them, um, you can find the set of components that we have available for you, the layers that you can use today, uh, a whole set of suites of things you can connect to. Um, so we have interface layers for things like DFS, uh, etcd, HA cluster, um, Java, um, <coughs> MapReduce, Monitoring MySQL, uh, Neutron, a whole suite of different things you can connect to, and a suite of layers to build off of. Uh, we have a set of things if you're building big data solutions, uh, some basic layers, things like uh, how do you manage apt a, as a layer, how do you manage uh, leadership election and, 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 and quorum within, it, within a cluster of services, how do you consume Docker. I have a payload that I deliver my application as Docker. We make it really easy for you to wrap that in a couple of lines of code, be it Bash, be it Python, um, and get that payload of Docker delivered as an application you can run and model through Juju. Um, if you're building stuff with Golang, um, Nginx, uh, OpenJDK, Node.js, if you're building a Node.js app, a layer for that. So we have a suite of layers that already solve a lot of these problems. Uh, we'll be showing how this integration looks like with something like Ansible, which is pretty applicable to most of the configuration management tools. While we don't have layers published here for those things yet, it's things we're working on actively solving and we're looking for help for people who are expertise in those uh, configuration management tools. That is more than all the time I have. I appreciate um, all your patience walking through this. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, we're in a break. Um, yep. Feel yeah, free to break up. 340 with you again, which is charm benchmark. Oh, good. Uh, so, so thank you. Um, any questions, please let them rip, otherwise, appreciate it.